I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and it is none other than Nubar Afayan. He is the founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering. It's an innovation company here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. When I write about them, I'm always tempted to call it a VC firm, a venture capital firm, uh, but no, they do invest in companies, but they also start them. They come up with the ideas, they staff the companies, they incubate them, and they spin them out, and the most important spin out of all, there's dozens of them, but the most important one is Moderna, and Nubar is also chairman of Moderna. So welcome, Nubar, to the stage. <laughs> Well, all right, thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio, for inviting me. Uh, I have exactly 14 minutes and 57 seconds to tell you about programmable medicines, which is a tall order because there are many, many companies now all emboldened by the experience of Moderna that are actually trying to make this a reality across every single disease. Um, let me just kind of make a bold kind of, uh, 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 I'd say, wish as opposed to assertion that that molecular medicine might well have seen a glimpse of its future in the last couple of years and hopefully would not go back. And what I mean by that is just encapsulated in this slide where, in fact, the time that it took between having a sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to having a... Um, evidence in at least animals or, or having mRNA in an LMP that you could test was a matter of days. Uh, the computational design was a matter of hours. And so once you do that, and the ultimate thing that goes into people's arms is exactly the thing that you had nine months earlier, the question is, what can we do to be able to do that safely, effectively, in many other cases? And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about that today. Um, I would contend uh, that biology is the original information technology. We, as humans, have created another artificial uh, form of information technology. But I think the more we learn about biology, the more we're going to begin, begin to treat it for what it is, which is an information technology. And, and you, when you think of it that way, we are largely the product of executing code. And it's a little belittling as humans, because we like to think of ourselves as much, much more than that. But in fact, we are fairly repeatable at, at the molecular level and the, the remarkably similar. And so that's an interesting thing we began to learn 20 years ago with the sequencing of so many different genomes. Let me use the Moderna example very briefly to kind of give you a, a, a sense of why we think this is even possible. Uh, Moderna was established in 2010. It came out of our labs at Flagship. It was our 18th such project. We now have some, nine, I think we're on the number 92 or 93. And it all started, as with every other one of our companies, with questions that are in the, in the form of what ifs. And we didn't say, we read this paper, what's this good for, etc. But really, we asked pretty basic kind of fantasy questions, if I can call it that. One is, what if you could use patients to make their own drugs? Another is, what if that could be done without changing their genome, so kind of in a transient, repeatable way? And what if all of that could be somewhat leveraging a far more reusable infrastructure than the bespoke, artisanal way in which drug discovery has been done since its existence, whether it's small molecules or proteins, having spent the last 35 years doing this, there is a very one-off nature of the way we do a lot in the industry. And the question was, could you do this in a more industrial, automated way? And of course, these were not all framed in these words, but this is kind of the essence of what led us down this path. And what, what exists today, a mere 12 years later, and I use the word, the word mere uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, for, for those of you in the tech industry, would say 12 years is a lifetime. In the biotech industry, 12 years is about, about the time you do anything useful. And so 12 years later, what exists today is 47 uh, drugs under development, vaccines and drugs. Uh, and, and 32 of them are being actively tested in human clinical trials. And of course, one of them, thanks to uh, the last couple of years, is a commercial product, in fact, two. Uh, including the boosters. We'll talk about that. So in a nutshell, to understand the kind of code version of this, um, you really need to think about the way information flows in biology, which kind of dogmatically has been viewed this way, which is DNA codes for mRNA, codes for proteins. Of course, 
All of you who know you know, cutting edge biology know that proteins affect DNA, proteins affect RNA, mRNA affects DNA. So this is a much messier picture than the happy picture that's painted here. But the general flow is that way because uh, inheritance is largely at the level of the DNA, although we're learning a lot of other things as well. And what we set out to do, drawn in this schematic that's probably now about eight, seven, eight years old, is to essentially be able to deliver a piece of code, a piece of software into a cell, and then use the cell's own operating system to be able to convert it into any protein we want, ideally. And those proteins could go to the mitochondria, the nucleus, they could go in a cell membrane, they could be secreted, and ideally, you'd like to be able to make it a universal way to prescribe for any protein you want. Ideally, in any cell you want, although that's a lot of idealism because we didn't have the technology to do that. There was a little bit of technology that preceded us in this space that had been used to deliver other kinds of nucleic acids, that is lipid nanoparticles, and so we started with that, but every other way we could think of to deliver as well. So this is kind of what we set out to do. This slide essentially lays out 10 years of platform development. Unlike the traditional biotech model, we set out to build a platform. And what was not known before COVID is that some two and a half billion dollars was spent building the mRNA platform at Moderna. Most of it privately. Only in the last two years had we been a public company. And along the way, including showing for the first time that you could do this in animals, showing for the first time that you can actually make therapeutic proteins, not just any protein, uh, the first vaccines that we tested in 2014 and 15 in flu, which also isn't known. People thought that we worked on COVID for the first time as our first product. It turns out it was our 10th vaccine product that had entered humans, the first one having been five years earlier. On and on and on. There was a lot of work done in how do you manufacture this. And what you'll see on this slide is a lot of partnership. One of the things when it comes to developing a whole new class of medicine is that you really benefit from working with people who are experts in these areas, not just scientific experts, but industrial experts. So we had partnerships with AstraZeneca, you'll see Merck, Alexion, Vertex, as well Barda, DARPA. So this was a long journey of partnerships and really going long term into how do we enable all this. Well, at the end of all that, um, we ended up being at a point in 2019 where we could actually go from an idea of what an mRNA design had to be all the way to being able to test it in a human within weeks. And you might say, how could that be? Why did you do that? There was no pandemic. And little known fact is that we were working on personalized cancer vaccines. And you may have heard, if you follow Moderna, a few weeks ago we announced for the first time that we had gotten some positive kind of indications and, and so we're ramping up that activity. But the idea of a personalized cancer vaccine is you take a patient's tumor, you essentially sequence it, you informatically find a whole bunch of neoantigens in it, so different mutations that look like they might be good for the immune system to go after. Then you synthesize a completely non-existent mRNA molecule that has 30, 40, 50 of these mutations in it all at once. You use that in an LMP, you give it back to the patient, and the patient's own immune system goes after those mutations, as many of them as possible with T cells, and causes an immune response in a vaccination type therapeutic vaccine. We had been doing that across hundreds of patients. And for every one of those patients' tumors, we had to sequence, design the RNA, make the LMP, stick it back into people within a couple of weeks. Thank God we had worked on that. Because when COVID showed up, we basically said, this is another cancer, so just make the personalized vaccine for this particular patient. In this case, it's not a patient, it's a subject. But the same workflow that you see pictured here is what actually enabled us to turn around very, very quickly. So what's happened since, which has been largely publicly covered, so I won't belabor it, is that from the time in January 11th that we had a sequence to the first human uh, data uh, starting to be gathered with the NIH through our partnership with them, to scaling up manufacturing with Lonza and as well in-house to getting the various approvals, that kind of like the time frame, the clock speed changed pretty dramatically. And there's a lot of reasons for that we can get into during the Q&A, but basically it took a pre-existing platform a real need to act quickly and in a coordinated way, a willingness to partner with between the government and all sorts of different uh, agencies, and then kind of a, a, a desperate attempt to make sure that we can get ahead of this threat. And that those things conspired to enable something that most people during the period thought would be completely impossible. But then the question to us becomes, are we gonna now say, okay, that was a really bad memory, let's forget it and go back to taking years and years to do similar things. And what has to change to be able to enable that? And that's an interesting question. So I'm not going to tackle that. I'm going to talk about the science behind some of these things. 
I, this is a slide that just kind of lays out all the different ways, things that helped. We didn't do these things in order to be ready for a pandemic, but we had these things by the time the pandemic came. And a very important one is the last one, which is that from day one in the company, there had been an embrace of everything digital. This is a, as much of a digital native company as one could have had across the dozens of other companies that we've been involved in before and hundreds that we know about. And that helped out a lot when it came down to going very, very rapidly. So let me zoom out a little bit and say that I, we think Moderna is one of the first examples of a category of programmable medicines because you do everything the same way and you change a code and you hope you get a different effect at the end in a predictable way. That's what I mean by a programmable medicine. And in fact, since, since the, the, the start of Moderna, we at Flagship have been busy creating a whole host of different companies which are at their core uh, based on the same programmability, not just with RNA, but also with DNA, with proteins and cells. This notion that you don't have to start from scratch every time you make a new drug gives you, a, a, you know, at least a little hope that we're going to go from a pure chance event to a semblance, maybe not fully, of a more deterministic activity, not a probabilistic activity. And of course, we'll never get to one extreme, but our hope is that the more we learn, the more we do things repeatedly, the more we can be confident in what we're doing. So this is laying out a whole bunch of cases. And this slide, in a, just a nutshell, for those of you interested in this space, to be aware of at least four examples that we have publicly talked about. Uh, the company in the bottom right, Omega Therapeutics, just entered the clinic with a programmable RNA-based way to make epigenetic changes in the genome. And in this case, it's to turn on and off genes in, in many of them at the same time. So it's a completely new approach. It's not antisense, it's not proteins, it's not CRISPR. It's literally epigenetic modifications. And they're going after CMIC as the very first target. CMIC has been a, a highly desirable target and has caused many, many failures in the industry, and we're hoping cancer, many, many cases are semic addicted cancers. This is something that, that we hope to be able to demonstrate. Tesla is working on gene writers, which to us are the, is the natural next generation of editing, which is really being able to insert entire genes exact in specific locations. Uh, Alterna is a completely new approach uh, based on tRNA. We are literally making medicines out of tRNA molecules. I don't have the time to get into the detail, but suffice it to say that if we can actually use tRNA at the moment in translation where it creates a correspondence between a codon and a corresponding amino acid, and we can actually change which amino acid gets put on, there's a whole host of rare genetic diseases that can be addressed this way, and we're going towards the clinic hopefully over the next year and a half or so in that approach. And then La Ronde is a next generation of translatable RNA that's based on circular and not linear mRNA. So lots of ways in which the, the theme is being varied. And I thought the remainder of the few minutes I have, I'll just talk about proteins because I've talked a lot about mRNA. So just in passing, let me say that a lot of this is becoming even more attractive because of the convergence between machine learning and artificial intelligence and the advances in biology, both our understanding, our ability to model, and our synthetic capability. These things kind of are coming at from two different worlds at a time where the, the convergence, which lots of people have talked about, is a very, very unique moment. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about one other programmable kind of attempt we've made to go after uh, a medicines, which has to do with proteins. So the question we asked ourselves several years ago, five years ago now, in a company that's now called Generate, uh, is, is what if we could be able to create a correspondence between an arbitrary protein function and its underlying DNA? So in other words, kind of imagine a black box between, and you can actually algorithmically train so that if you want something to bind to something at a particular space, it could actually spit out the DNA that could do that. And what would it take to do that? And of course, we know that there's a lot of generative AI going on these days, and a lot of the techniques that have been developed have never made their way, had not four years ago, certainly in the biology space. And we thought we'd try some of these approaches instead of what's been done, which is to try to predict how proteins fold. And that's a space that a lot of advances are happening in. We're not using that at all in what we're doing here. We're basically trying to, through lots and lots of data of instances, trying to see if we can get DNA trained, if you will, to be able to express itself in the form of function, most notably binding. So that, the idea of generating therapeutics so that you could, the programmability would come from the use of an algorithm to do it, not either you know, sophisticated molecular or, or, or medicinal chemistry or protein design or folding predictions, that's what we set out to do. And I don't have a ton of time, but I've, we've, we, we, this, some of this is, is available publicly before. This is kind of what we want to do, is use instances essentially encode the information into 
uh, learning networks and then use that to begin to make predictions and do that enough cycles that you can begin to get more and more uh, confident about what's coming out the other end. And we applied this to a very interesting problem in the therapeutic space, which is the ability to make antibodies against any arbitrary part of any protein. So if you take the spike protein, for example, where lots of people are developing therapeutic antibodies, as soon as they do, the virus, which has its own form of artificial intelligence, I guess, viral intelligence, can basically avoid it and mutate away. The question is, can we actually be able to specify that we want to bind this particular spot, partly because it may be a really important one, partly it may be one that you can't really mutate away as the virus, but that capability doesn't really exist. You could do this experimentally, it takes six to 12 months. We wanted to do this computationally. And I will not do it justice to say that, that this, is, this is something that we've begun to be able to do. We have, in fact, designed thousands of antibodies. Basically, we've designed antibodies computationally using these approaches for every single therapeutic target that's out in the market. We're comparing them to what the current antibodies are. And we believe that designing antibodies, for that matter, designing enzymes, designing other soluble receptors will be an act of computational generation. And happy to talk more about that. This is such an important part of everything that we're doing now. There's about eight of the companies that are entirely predicated on generative AI capabilities. And a lot of this is becoming core to every bit as much as sequencing and, and various other automated techniques. This is becoming core to just about everything that, that we do. And the more advanced things that we're trying to do, which um, you know, in, in, in technology review is covered on the left side, probably not as much on the right side, is actually taking some of the most recent kind of uh, uh, um, style transfer capabilities that have been used in art, in music, in writing, et cetera, and apply them directly to proteins. Can you style transfer between a protein and another protein? And in fact, we're doing that in the lab using these computational approaches. And with that, I think I'm out of time. We'll talk some more. Thank you.